pray, God, that you would open up our eyes to your presence in this place tonight. As we sing to you and as we worship you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This goes out to every outcast to the just don't quite fit in. with someone last night that was, we were, we were doing a Bible study and he pointed out something that uh, is, is a real encouragement to me and I know will be to you that, you know, David was an extremely wretched man, just like all of us. Of course, I don't know if we have too many murderous adulterers in the room, but uh, we don't tell me. Uh, so I don't want to change my perspective on you. I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, it, you know, it talks about that in First Samuel or Second Sam, First Samuel, Second Samuel. Sorry, uh, but then, 500 years later in the Book of Chronicles, when it talks about him, it, it doesn't it doesn't mention it. It doesn't it doesn't bring it back up. And I think there's a sense there because God doesn't remember it. And the same is true for all of our sin that God doesn't remember it. Right? As far as east is from the west, so far has He separated our sin from us. And that's good news. So as we worship the Lord tonight, 
Let's just remember that. I mean, even sometimes we just need a slap in the face, wake up of like, man, all these things I'm worried about, all these things I'm struggling with, all these things that I'm angry and, and pessimistic and all these things, God, I just give them to you. Remember, God died for your sin. And that's what matters.
lost in darkness. There's hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today. That Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow. For tomorrow's in your hands. And all I need you will provide. Just like you always have. Cause I'm fighting a battle. You've recognize the Lord's battle, that he has already won it, and that he is victorious. But we know how the story ends. You know the song. Here we go. And I know how the story Oh, yeah. 
Cause I'm fighting a battle. Come on. You've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you you, Jesus. Lord, as we sing at times, we know that it may look like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by you. We are surrounded by you. Open up our eyes, Lord, that we would see that when these things that seem to be coming against us are actually working together for us, for your purposes, though it might cause pain, though it might even cause death, Though it might cause separation and hurt and grief and loss and, and all of those things, Lord, you work all things together for those that are the called according to your purposes. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray that we would keep our eyes on you because we know how the story ends. We know that you've won the battle already. We know that your kingdom is, is here and it's coming. We thank you for that, God. And I just pray tonight that you would give Jackie a double portion of your spirit as he preaches out of Zechariah 14 that we would have open hearts, open minds to receive your truth tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're really almost ready. Um, before we jump into Zechariah tonight, um, uh, Tony Haynes has been transferred to Boise Hospital. He has been having a series of seizures they can't stop. So family's asking for prayer. So we're going to lift up Tony before we uh, jump into everything and uh, just ask God to be with him. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, come before you, Lord. We lift up Tony. We don't know uh, a lot of information. We just know that, uh, God, he's in need of your touch, your healing, uh, God, upon his body. We pray for peace uh, with his wife, Lord. We pray for wisdom with the doctors who are trying to understand what's going on. And ultimately, God, we pray that, uh, that you would move on his behalf, Lord. We lift him to you. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would move in and through him. And as, uh, as always, we lift up Tony, Lord, I'm thinking also about Dylan. So, God, I just pray you would touch Dylan and uh, bring your healing and comfort to the family for him as well, Lord. And, and uh, there's no shortage. So, God, you know all those who are in need. We pray your hand to be upon them. Uh, your blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah has been fun for me because most, most, is most the right word? Let's go with a lot of the Bible is, is easier for me. Zechariah is a challenge. I like challenges. So it's very cool when you look at it. It was interesting because when I started the study on Zechariah, I don't have time to do all this, but I'm going to do it anyway. When I started the study on Zechariah, you know, I'm, I always have a lot of different uh, sources that I go to. And so one of them, well, every one of them said something to the effect of uh, Zechariah is a wild ride. That's, that's a, a Jackie-ism for 
whatever they said. And it was, uh, and I have found that that is a true statement. In fact, as I was preparing for chapter 14, I came across something that Martin Luther wrote. He wrote two commentaries on Zechariah. And the first one, he got all the way to chapter 13 and he stopped. And then he just turned it in or whatever you could, you, where, wherever you turned things in back in those days. And uh, he finished it and a year later, he did it again. So he did Zechariah again a year later. Uh, and it says, um, Luther's second commentary on Zechariah, written one year after his first, uh, still offers only limited comments on chapter 14. But in the second one, Luther begins with the following admonition. Here in this chapter, I give up. I do not know what the prophet is talking about. Now, wouldn't it be refreshing if more people could make the, ad, the admission that we don't always have answers for everything? One of the things that, that I have been discussing is we have a tendency as Bible teachers to um, have a particular hammer and on the end of that hammer is our system. And whenever we come to something that's hard for us to understand, we just pound that hammer on it and make it fit. You guys understand what I'm saying? So we're not going to do that. We're going to look at what Zacharias says. We're going to talk about what he writes. And I want you to think about Zacharias' prophecies like uh, individual snapshots of events. Not like a, a solid flow. You'll understand when we jump into it. Not like a straight flow, because you, if you try to figure out the straight flow and fit it in your timeline of how you think things are supposed to work, you're going to miss the point. So take a look at the snapshots, understand the message of the snapshots, and then back up and look at the overall message or the point of what he's writing, and I think, and that way we won't miss Zachariah's point. We won't miss what he's laying out for us. So he starts with Yahweh's judgment on Jerusalem. So let's jump in. It says in verse 1, Behold, the day is coming. That's been one of Zechariah's favorite phrases. So, so far there have been a lot of days. Behold, there's a day coming. Behold, there's a day coming. Behold, there's a day coming. And I think as we look at Zechariah 14, we're, we're drawing awful near to the last day, what we would call the day of the Lord. The Bible talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the final day of judgment. That's what the Bible teaches us on the day of the Lord. There will be a time when the Lord returns, judges, the uh, living and the dead. We enter into new heaven and new earth. Boom, where it's, things are finished. And so as he's laying out his concept, he says, now there's going to be a day coming for, uh, for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be taken. Oh, see, you guys were already running off somewhere, weren't you? I'm going to draw all the, na the, the nations of the world in battle against Jerusalem. And we know what that's about, right? Oh, except they lose. Did you catch that part? So you're looking at it and he says, I'm going to gather them all. They're going to divide your spoil in the midst. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be taken and the houses will be plundered and the women will be raped. Okay, that's seems bad, right? So it begins, this chapter begins with a judgment from God on Jerusalem in particular, maybe on a broader sense, uh, the nation of Israel, but particularly on Jerusalem. And he says, half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be cut off. So half of the city, they're going to either go to exile or be wiped out, and half of the city is going to get to stay. Now, if you remember last week, we looked at a judgment where he talks about two-thirds of Israel being killed and one-third coming through, and we talked about how that may line up with the, the events that took place in AD 70, but we also talked about the fact that other people look for that to be yet a future event. 
But the problem with this one is I don't, nobody knows where to put it. Where's this event? Historically, we don't necessarily have a point. I'm not saying that Jerusalem was never uh, conquered. The city of peace has spent a lot of time being conquered. So, but the point that he's laying out for us, there's going to be a day of judgment. We have the exact same phrasing being given from this in Isaiah chapter 13, which also, again, is talking about a day of the Lord. And, and I think more specifically, God's judgment on Babylon but he uses some of the same phrases. Their houses will be plundered. Their wives will be ravished. Some of the same ideas that we see. So the concept is there is a punishment from Yahweh coming. Now, we are thankful that that's not the final word. If you remember, as we went through the book of Joel, and we talked about the prophet Joel, and as we talked about the prophet Amos, when we looked at those, the day of the Lord begins with the evening. And we made it a point to understand that for the Jew, the Jewish calendar is built on a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. So the days begin at evening and they end, you know, at f f the next evening. So first you have night, then you have light. When we talk about the day of the Lord, the judgment of God that comes upon whomever it falls upon, that is spoken of as a day of darkness, not of light. But it dawns with the, with the day, for there is sorrow in the evening, but how's it go? Joy comes when? In the morning, okay? So this, you have the same thing prophetically when we look at God's judgments. Now, so this, that's your first snapshot, okay? First snapshot Israel is judged, half of the people wiped out, half of the people get to stay. Verse 3, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. So in verse 3, you get a snapshot of now the Lord doing battle for Israel. Now the Lord is going forth. And this is going to sound familiar to us. It sounds like in verse 3, Yahweh's changing sides. It's like, well, first I brought judgment here, and then this event occurred, and then I'm going to turn, and I'm going to fight against those nations. It says in verse 4, and on that day, there's that phrase, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that half of the mount shall move northward and half shall move southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. So you have the first snapshot, judgment upon Jerusalem, S second snapshot, now God fighting for Jerusalem, standing on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is split in two, <clears throat> a giant valley in the beginning, a giant valley, which becomes a valley, which is a path of escape for those who are left in Jerusalem. Then the Lord, God, then the Lord my God will come with all the holy ones with him. So you have this Snapshot number two. We see judgment beginning uh, with the people of God. Isn't that what the Lord said? Judgment begins where? In the house of the Lord. Okay. And then now we see the Lord judging the nations. He's turned his attention toward the nations. We have judgment falling upon them. The scripture says it will be like it was in the day of the earthquake in Uzziah. Now, if you remember when we were in the book of Amos, we talked about it. In Amos 1.1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So they're dating it by this earthquake that occurred in the time of Uzziah. Now, Zechariah is pointing, hey, this earthquake, when, when the Lord returns, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives splits, 
It's going to be like that earthquake way back in the days of Uzziah. So he points back to this event that takes place. And he says, right, there's going to be a division. Now, part of the idea of what's going on and part of the thing that we want to keep in mind, why, why the Mount of Olives? There's lots of places God could return. When the Lord returns, he could come anywhere in a circular deal around Jerusalem. Why the Mount of Olives? Well, if you know, you know. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to tell you. No, that'd be cruel, huh? So in the book of Ezekiel, the glory leaves the temple and departs out the eastern gate. And then that glory goes all the way to Babylon to Ezekiel. Remember the, the chariot of God, the, the chariot of God that comes before Ezekiel and gives Ezekiel the call as a prophet? You see, all the people thought, well, God's presence is in Jerusalem. We're out here in Babylon. God's, God's not with us here. So then God shows up and says, nope, I'm with you. I'm not there. And if you consider the things that Jesus said in Matthew 21 through 24, one of the last declarations that Jesus makes about the temple, he says, see, your house is left to you, what? Desolate. Now, Palm Sunday, Jesus comes walking in the same gate that the, the glory of the Lord had departed. But what happened? He was rejected, right? Now, when the Lord returns, he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives, which is directly across from the Eastern Gate. That's why he's coming to the Mount of Olives. That's why this is a place where his feet are going to touch the ground. Look in Ezekiel 43, 1 through 4. It says, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. The sound of the coming was like the sound of many waters. And the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was just like the vision I had when he came to destroy the city. And just like the vision that I had saw at the Kabar Canal, I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. So on that, just straight across, if you, if you, if, so there's so many ifs in this sentence. If Israel is not still at war and we actually go to Israel this year and you decide to come, <laughs> there's lots of ifs, right? And we go to the eastern gate on the Temple Mount and we look across, we are looking at the Mount of Olives. Every, all those pictures where you see a picture of like the, the dome of the rock, the, the, the golden dome on top of the Temple Mount, and this picture, a panoramic picture of Jerusalem. You guys familiar with the, the photo? If you've never seen it, there's one in my office. You can go look at it. That picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives overlooks the the city of Jerusalem. So this second snapshot, we have the Lord returning, his feet hit the ground, and he has all of his holy ones with him. Now he goes on in verse 6. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. There shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord neither day nor night but at the evening time there will be light so you have this picture this this language in this next snapshot sounds like a day in which creation begins again you have a day it's not day it's not night it's not cold it's not frost it's not all these things but then at the evening there will be light. Do you guys remember how creation started? How did it start? Let there be what? Light. Let there be light. So, so you have this, the picture, the idea in your mind. Think of it in terms of snapshots, right? I, we have three snapshots. Uh, a judgment over Jerusalem. The, the picture of the judgment over the nations. The picture of the Lord returning, his feet hitting down on, on the Mount of Olives, right? 
and then a unique day like there's never been. Not day, not night, totally different. Never been a day like that day. So the, the closest thing I think we could relate that to is like the day when you have a new heaven and a new earth. The recreation is, is coming to pass. At evening time, there shall be light. Now I want you to remember Amos 5.18. We spoke about it a little bit. Amos 5.18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. So the day of the Lord for you and I, for believers, well, it's going to be different for us than it is for everybody else, right? Because we'll be with him, won't we? So we'll be with him. So the point is when the Lord comes, his second coming, what does the, valley, what does the battle of Armageddon look like? A, a good day? No, not for anybody who's there, right? What does the day look like for Jerusalem when God's judgment falls upon them? You know, uh, on, on any, even if it was in the middle of their history, pick one of the times God judged Jerusalem. It's a bad day when God's judgment comes, right? It's a day of darkness, not of light. So the idea that the scripture is laying out on this particular day is a picture of God's judgment, the judgment of the nations. Think a great white throne. Think uh, the, 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 all the, the dead coming before the Lord and facing their judgment and all that judgment comes. And then what's the day after that look like? See, it's a unique day, not like any other day. And then in the evening, there will be light. So he's, he's, he's just describing like a photograph, okay? Everybody tracking with me? Everybody understand why Zechariah is challenging? Yeah? And you don't know why I don't just pick out a hammer and hit it with a system? But we want to know what the Bible says, right? What does, it, what does the Bible say? Okay, next snapshot, verse 8. <clears throat> On that day, living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea, and it will continue in summer and in winter. So the idea is it's never going to dry up. Now, I want you to know in Jerusalem, in Israel, they rely on rain. Uh, it's a little different for, for us in Idaho because we have, we have what, do you, what do we call these things? Well, canals, that's what I was looking for. But you know, when I was 30, I don't remember losing words like that. You had a birthday. I did have a birthday. And them words go faster and faster every day. Okay, so we have these canals, right, that bring irrigation. So we don't necessarily have to have, you know, we can't survive. They just cut back the water. We can't survive extended drought. But you, you know what I'm saying. We have answers. Well, in Israel, you have rain or you have sand. So we needed the rain. So what did the Lord say? Part of the Lord's deal with them was, look, if you're walking with me, I'm going to give you the early and the latter rains and your crops are going to come in and everything's going to be okay. But if you're not, you're not doing okay, I'm going to withhold the rain. We're going to see that concept talked about in chapter 14 again. So... But this picture is when the Lord returns in the new Jerusalem, you don't have to worry about water. There's a river flowing right out of Jerusalem. Now, if you read Ezekiel 48 and Revelation 22, you see the same thing. From the throne of God, what's flowing? The river of living water. And that water does what? Brings life, right? In Ezekiel, it makes the dead sea live again. Here, it, it just mentions that it flows to the, to the sea, the western sea and the eastern sea. One, the Mediterranean, the other, the Dead Sea. So it speaks of an everlasting supply of water in Jerusalem. The, the river, the, 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 actually it's the Brook Kidron. And if you go to the Brook Kidron and you're hoping to get a drink, you're going to be bummed. Because occasionally, seasonally, there'll be a little water in it. But you can jump right over it. 
So now the Lord's saying there's going to be a river, a river of living water where? In the desert. That sounds like a promise God's given before, right? So he gives this picture. Hey, think of the new Jerusalem. And we have this place where we have the, the rivers of living water. And everything that is necessary that we need. It'll continue summer as in winter. It's always going to be there. And Jerusalem is going to be the source of an ever-flowing river. <coughs> so you have this, another snapshot. See, we got another snapshot of what's going on. And then we have the snapshot of the Lord ruling over it all. Look, look at verse 9. And the Lord will be king over what? What's it say? It does not say just Israel, does it? And the Lord will be king over all the earth. It's all his. Revelation, do we read that? Yeah, one of the trumpet judgments is an angel flying down to earth, sticking a banner in the ground that declares all the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. It's all his. And so here, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, the Lord will be Echad. That's weird. And his name, Echad. Now, for you and I, maybe we, we don't get it. The Shema begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, he is Echad, one. And Echad is the exact same word used for the relationship between a husband and a wife. And the two become one flesh, right? You guys have heard it before. So we have this picture of the Godhead the perfect unity or oneness of God. That's why we talk about three in one. Okay, you have, he, it's not, he doesn't use a word that means one and only. He uses a word that describes a compound, a, a, a unity, a plurality in unity. And he describes that the Lord's name's gonna be one and the Lord will be one. And so you have the fulfillment of his kingdom, right? This is it. King of kings, Lord of lords, the whole land is going to be turned into a plain. Why? I don't know. I can tell you this. I spent a lot of money, <coughs> a lot of money on a crazy amount of commentaries. And I could have saved all that money because when I look at them all, you know what they say? I don't know. I don't know, but it's like the Lord is, when well, you have a picture, right, in the snapshot, you have a picture of Jerusalem kind of being the peak, the highest point, and then everything else being a little lower than that, and then a plain as far as you can see, just, just flat ground, not bad ground, just flat ground going out from Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate. And from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses, and it shall be inhabited. So he's saying, look, oh, we saw the judgment earlier, right? And half of the people cut off and half of the people still there. And then we saw God judge the nations and, and provide an escape for those who were in Israel. And then we... We, we saw the Lord return his feet, hit the Mount of Olives, it split. We see the river flowing out of Jerusalem. And then here the Lord says, Jerusalem's going to be full. Do you know the size of the new Jerusalem? It's roughly the size of the moon. Well, it's bigger than any city I know of. In fact, I have heard it said that there's enough place on the square footage of the new Jerusalem that it would fit every man, woman, and child. What is it Jesus talked about preparing a place for you? Is the new Jerusalem big enough? Is, does God have enough room? What if the whole world believes? Does God have enough room? So you have this, and so he says, look, it's going to be full. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. 
Now, why is this important for a bunch of guys that just came home from exile? Don't, don't forget the first picture they got. You see the first picture? The first picture was God judging Jerusalem. So that, that's the, exactly what you want to hear right after you came out of 70 years of exile, right? 70 years of exile, we finally come back home, we're rebuilding Jerusalem, and then the first vision he lays on us is a judgment against Jerusalem. That seems just like how we are, doesn't it? When we look at the history of Israel, it's a history that sometimes we ask, why don't they get it? Until you match the history of Israel with your life. And then we ask ourselves, why don't I get it? Well, because I have the same disease they have. What's that disease called? Sin. What's the cure to my disease? Jesus' vicarious atonement, right? He died for me. He cleanses me. He also, by the way, cleanses them. And according to Joel chapter 2, he cleanses who? Everyone who will call on the name of the Lord. So you have this beautiful picture. So he's telling them, hey, there's a day coming. He, it might not, might not be today. Those guys are rebuilding Jerusalem with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And they're fighting and they're building and they're, they're asking God all the questions about why is life got to be so hard? Anybody ever ask those questions? And while that's all going on, the encouragement that Zechariah has is basically we're going to fail again and we're going to struggle, but there's a day coming when God's going to rule and reign and there'll be peace and we will dwell securely. There will be a day we will dwell in security with the Lord. Ezekiel 28 verse 26 says, and they shall dwell securely in it and they will build houses and plant vineyards and they will dwell securely and I will execute judgments on all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt and they will know I am the Lord. So you have this, this is a common theme for Israel. The idea that there will come a day there's going to come a day. We're going to get it right. Well, where's that day at? There's, a, there's not a shortage of theories about when that day comes and what's the order of events before that day comes. And all of those theories don't matter. There's only one part that matters. That day is coming. That's all we need to know. That day's coming. All the theories and thoughts about when and how and what's going to happen before it happens, that tickles our ears. And maybe it causes us to get excited. But pretty much the one thing I'm sure of is almost everybody's wrong somewhere. So, but we hold on to what God has told us, right? Because we all believe this. Jesus Christ, he's going to return. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. We're going to live eternally with him. There's going to be a day of darkness and the judgment of God, but then there's going to be a day of light. And we will see the, the hand of God moving in our midst. Now listen to this. Oh, not quite to the last part. Almost the last part. <laughs> Next picture. This shall be the plague. With, with, with which the Lord will strike all the people who wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will, will rot while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in the sockets. Their tongues will rot in their mouths. And on that day, a great panic from the Lord will fall upon them. So that each will seize the hand of another. And the hand of the one will be raised against the hand of the other. Verse 14, we've seen this phrase before, right? In chapter 12, even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. So you have a picture of Judah fighting, Jerusalem fighting, surrounded by enemies. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected. Gold, silver garments in great abundance. And a plague like this plague will fall upon the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts will be in those camps. 
So this snapshot, what do we see? We see Yahweh's defeat of the nations. We see a divine plague. We see a divine panic. And the last thing we see is divine plunder. So God, God's going to deliver. God's going to bring the victory. And ultimately, God is one. But the other thing we see that we still can't fit in any of our systems, Judah plays a key role in reversing what's happening in Jerusalem. Well, that's interesting, no? Judah. Now, now I do, I, I, I readily admit that Jesus Christ is a lion of the tribe of Judah. But nowhere in Scripture has he ever been described as being Judah. He's described a lot of ways, but he's not been described like that. So it still remains a bit of a mystery. How, where's that at? How's that fit? How's that fit in all our systems or our plans or our ideas about how everything flows? And at the end of the day, does it matter? If you know how Judah fits in the puzzle, is it going to save your soul? Is it going to help you? What is the word that Jesus told us when he describes the last days? What does he tell us? Be ready. He said, he don't say be lazy. He doesn't say be sleeping. He doesn't say, he says be ready. Be ready. That means we know we have a job to do and we're doing the job we're supposed to do until we see his face. Amen? Amen. So we have, this is your next snapshot, right? So if you've been with me as we've been working our way through the snapshots, you begin to realize whatever system you have, whatever ideas you have about the the end times, you can't fit this in a line in them. It doesn't go there. But it's still God's word. It's absolute truth, right? It's God's message from Zechariah to the exiles rebuilding Jerusalem. So we, we hold on to the things that we can recognize and see. We put our faith and trust in him, and we know at the end, God is going to be able to deliver. Now, the, now's my favorite one. Here's my favorite one. Five more verses in two minutes. Ready? On your mark, get set. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles. And if any of the families of the earth don't go to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain upon them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves... Then on them there shall be no rain, and there shall be a plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feasts of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations (coughs) that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. And on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be like the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts. So that that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall be no longer a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Now, when we look at this, you ought to have a lot of questions. If you don't, you're not thinking about it very much. So, first question, why are we celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles? There are seven feasts. Why the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, maybe it's because of what the Feast of Tabernacles represents. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, is also called the Feast of Ingathering. It is the celebration for the harvest for all who are gathered together. The celebration of the harvest. That reminds me of something I read in Revelation once where it talks about the 144,000 who have, 
who have been the foundation of an innumerable host that can't be numbered from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Are you familiar? This beautiful picture of the redeemed, a picture of the redeemed in Revelation. If you see this picture of the redeemed, they're all, it's all about or described by this photograph celebrating the feasts of ingathering and celebrating the harvest. And then you have this idea. There's a, a picture about what happens if anyone disobeys. Now, it doesn't say anyone disobeys. It just says, if they do, there's no rain. So who wants to live in a desert with no rain? Well, I don't know anybody who wants to do that. So it's, it's a, the point is you're going to celebrate. It doesn't say there's rebellion. It just says if you rebel, God has a, a plan and a purpose for that. And the reason I'm going to say there's no rebellion is because of what he said about the horses. Did you catch the horses? Oh, I don't want you to miss the horse is kind of important. It says then on the bells of the horse shall be inscribed holy to the Lord. Are you aware the horse is unclean? So not only is that which is unclean made clean, it's more than that. What is unclean is made holy to the Lord. Now, what does that remind you of? Can you think of any people group that was once upon a time unclean, totally unholy? that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, not only is made clean, but is made holy to the Lord. So he describes this as a horse, it's unclean animal, now wearing what the high priest wears. The high priest of the nation of Israel wears holiness to the Lord. That was part of his badge. And so here you have this unclean animal, but not just the unclean animal, then he starts talking about all the pots and pans in the whole area. They're all going to be like the ones at the, at the altar. What made the ones at the altar so special? They're the ones that caught what? They caught the blood. They all, they all caught the, the blood is that which brought, without the shedding of blood, there can be? No remission of sin, right? No remission of sin. And so you have this picture of these things that were common <coughs> that are not going to be common anymore. These things that were unclean that are not only not going to be unclean, they're going to be holy. They're all going to be together in one world and they're all in one world going to be coming together to celebrate the harvest that God brought as he redeems not only Israel, but everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. So you have this incredible picture, this incredible picture of, of those at the end who turn to the Lord, I think being illustrated by these things. I think one of the dangers we fall into is when we come to the, these prophetic books and we try to put something into <coughs> the, the minutest parts of the detail. And we want to understand. And while we're doing that, if you remember, I talked about this before, we take the living, breathing point and we chop it up so much we lose it. It's the difference between dissection and vivisection, remember? When you guys go to the hospital, you don't want to be dissected, right? You, you, you don't want to die and have them chop up your pieces. You want to have a vivisection. You want them to work on you, operate on you, and keep you alive while they do it. So we want the idea, yes, I know it's surgery, but stick with my rhyming words. It makes me happy. So when we, when we look at that picture, we don't want to lose the story. What's the story in Zechariah 14? God's going to judge Jerusalem. God's going to judge the nations. 
The Lord's going to return. His feet are going to hit the ground. God's going to prepare the world to, to receive the new Jerusalem with a river of living water that's going to flow from it and heal the bodies of water that it touches. The other prophetic books tell us it's going to heal the nations. You have the, the, the trees of life growing on either side of the river and its leaves will heal the nations. The scripture is laying out for us snapshots of all these prophetic events that, that have yet to come and maybe some where we've seen little pieces of them in the past, but the reality is as we look at it all, what's the point? What is he telling us? What is Zechariah leaving us with? Because otherwise when you get to the end, you just go, well, there's not gonna be any more traders in the house of the Lord. No more merchants, no more buying and selling. Kind of like the idea where Jesus, when he cleansed the temple, he drove out the many changers, you remember? And he said, my father's house shall not be a house of merchandise or a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And then you have this description of all the nations coming together to worship God for the harvest that he's brought in of all the nations centered on Jerusalem. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of what <coughs> God is and how God is uh, working in the lives of, of his people. So the book of Zechariah began with a prophetic cry to turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord for all the people of God, which will be met with a turning of God toward the people. And this reaction lies at the heart of the book's vision for restoration, rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding your life. This book has consistently revealed God's passion for relationship. God's passion for his people, not only with them, but also with all the nations of the world. From the beginning, there was a call for the light to the Gentiles. And while the path to all these scenes and visions that we've looked at is one that's carved through a lot of discipline and a lot of struggles. As we look at it, it's still one that's engendered and continues to engender the idea of hope. There will be a day and we will see him face to face and realize Yahweh as the king of all the earth. Amen? Why don't you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for the opportunity that you give us to study your word, to open your word, to be challenged by it, Lord, and to try in, in any way that we are able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height, breadth, width, and depth of the love of God, which we see in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God, as we as we close off Zechariah and as we set our eyes toward Malachi and the final book of the Old Testament, the last book that we haven't taught here in Buell, Lord, we pray, God, that you would help us understand, recognize, and learn the lessons that your word has declared to us and not be afraid of what we don't know. I wouldn't worry about what we don't know or what we don't understand. Lord, I pray that we would focus on what we do know and what we do understand and what we do recognize. And I, I pray that we would never lose hope. So when we look at our world like today and we see Israel at war, we see the nations raging, that's not something you haven't talked about in your word. That's not a situation you haven't declared yourself to be Lord over. So God, we, we look to you with expectancy because we know, hey, these are, these are things. These may be beginnings of birth pangs. Maybe we're going to see some prophetic things uh, unfold before us. Whether we do or whether we don't, we still know what it is 
our great God and King is asking of us. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them the things that I taught you. And remember, lo, I am with you always. I'm with you in, if things turn sour. I'm with you if your nation falls under judgment. I'm with you if you're surrounded by all the enemies. I'm with you no matter what. Because you, Lord God, are the one who calls out and takes that which is unclean and makes it holy by simply touching us with your hand. Just like the leper, you declare, I am willing. And you bring your healing and blessing and salvation to our life. So, Lord, we thank you for the truth that you declare. And we pray, God, you would help us as we go from this place to fulfill our purpose for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God, equip us as we go from this place to bring honor and glory to you. And we give you all the thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.